The war on terror marks, I believe, a significant shift in contemporary articulations of whiteness, with the administration defining Western societies as gravely threatened by the murderous violence of the Islamists, whiteness is being redefined as vulnerable and as endangered, innocent and unable to comprehend the reasons for the hatreds of these fanatic non-Western Muslims. Even today, most of the public discussions about the war and Canada's role in it take place at the level of we are good, Western civilization is superior, they are evil, we want to save them, they want to kill us. This continues to remain the basic frame within which political discussion in this country takes place about Canada's participation in the war. Despite the reality that the United States is an unprecedented power, that Canada is allied with the world's only superpower, most Canadian elites and media commentators have given credence to the discourse of the vulnerability of Westerners by their own deployments of this language and have also facilitated its extension of this kind of recasting of whiteness as vulnerable beyond the borders of the United States. I want to give you a little story about an interview that I did over the last couple of days. I won't say where and who, who it was with, uh, but there was a, 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 a woman sitting with me in the studio and she asked me what I was going to say in my speech. And what I said was I'm going to be calling for us to continue organizing to pull the Canadian troops out of Afghanistan immediately. And she asked me, and I want to quote what she said to me. She said to me, if we bring our troops back home, how can we leave those women behind? The breathtaking arrogance of such a statement, how can we leave those women behind? What does it mean, leave them behind? It's as if Afghan women are not part of their society, as if they haven't been struggling to change their society, as if they haven't been fighting for their rights, that Canadian soldiers are actually there defending Afghan women. I mean, six years after the war, we still continue to have to deal with these kinds of debates. And I have to say that this was a feminist. She identified herself as a feminist and also as a leftist. So you can imagine, if we have to deal with these kinds of issues in the left movements and organizations that we're part of, in the feminist movements and organizations that we're part of, it gives you some inkling of how strongly this institution of white supremacy, which continues to see itself as benevolent at a global level, how deeply that has been strengthened. White bodies today are treated as innocent and vulnerable anywhere and everywhere. They only want to save and protect. And black and brown bodies are treated as, if not actual, potential threats anywhere and everywhere. This reinvigoration of white supremacy <clears throat> is going to deepen the racial divisions that have existed in most Western societies. This means that we have to continue to press to discuss international conflicts as well as the phenomenon of terrorism within the context of power relations, within the context of international relations that have been deeply shaped by colonialism, the ongoing relations of imperialism, but continue to be discussed within the context of a deeply racialized colonial mentality. We have to contest this white men civilizing burden which today is also being claimed by white women. It means that we have to raise tough questions. What does it mean that the most heavily armed military power in the world defines itself as vulnerable, more vulnerable than the societies it invades, bombs and occupies? How is it possible that such self-delusional views get upheld by the leading intellectuals of a society? How can we disrupt the media's upholding of such delusions? Because the media, I think, contributes and continues to play a very important role in propagating war propaganda for the political elites in this country and also in the United States. And finally, my third point is that 
While we continue to focus, in the United States, as I said, the political debate is about when and how quickly to withdraw the American troops out of Iraq. In Canada, the debate is focused very much on Canadian troops and the withdrawal of Canadian troops. But my third point is that we have to be really vigilant. It remains really important for us to continue to pay attention to what the United States is doing about the question of Iran. And it remains a serious possibility that the Bush administration might well be considering expanding the war by attacking Iran before Bush leaves the White House. Both General Petraeus and the US ambassador to Iraq, Ryan Crocker, singled out Iran several times in their reports yesterday as a source of many of the problems that the Americans are facing in Iraq. Iran is accused of supporting and arming sectarian militias, especially in the South. Iran is accused of trying to exploit the situation to increase its own influence and power within the region, as if that would be a surprise, and as if one would not anticipate that to be the case right from the beginning of this disastrous war. Bush has already called Iran, quote unquote, the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. And the Sunday Times of London has written that the Pentagon has already developed plans to attack 1,200 targets inside Iran in the space of three days. As Robert Neiman says in a recent article about this targeting of Iraq, it's simply a great power struggle for influence. And while there's nothing too shocking about that, people in the United States should ask themselves and be asked by others. And I want to repeat this because I think it points to what we should also be asking. And be asked by others what sacrifices we're willing to bear so that the Bush administration can try to keep Iran from having the influence in Iraq that they would normally have and almost certainly will have if there is a democratic government in, in Iraq, given that 60% of the Iraqi population is Shiite and has strong cultural and religious ties to their co-religionists in Iran. We have to keep asking this difficult question and we have to make sure that the Canadian government is listening and also asking this question. As Noam Chomsky has explained in, a, in an article, the major concern, he says, is the following. It is likely, though little discussed, that a prime concern about Iran's influence is to the east, where in mid-August, Russia and China hosted Iran's president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, at a summit of a Central Asian Security Club designed to counter U.S. influence in the region. The Security Club is the Shanghai Corporation organization which has slowly been taking shape in recent years. Its membership includes not only the two giants, Russia and China, but also the energy-rich Central Asian states, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan. Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan was a guest of honor at the August meeting. In another unwelcome development for the Americans, Turkmenistan's president also accepted an invitation to attend the summit, another step in its improvement of relations with Russia, particularly in energy, reversing a long-standing policy of isolation from Russia. Russia in May secured a deal to build a new pipeline to import more gas from Turkmenistan, bolstering its dominant hold on supplies in Europe and heading off a competing US-backed plan that would bypass Russian territory. So this is what Noam Chomsky says the concern about Iran really is. And I think we have to pay attention to that. And whatever the cause is for a potential attack on Iran, we have to be ready in our organizations, in our movements, to organize opposition against any escalation of this war on terror, against any attack on Iran. Thank you very much.